How is the food industry able to create new products that hook us so well and we enjoy eating them so much? In this video, I want to let you peek behind the curtain of the food industry by sharing with you my story and my experience working as a food scientist in a food company. I want to reveal how food product developers go about creating new products that they are pretty sure are going to sell really well and why this very often can be a problem for us as consumers, because we can get a misalignment between what the company wants and what's the best for our health. Let's go, friend. So I began my career in science. I did a PhD in organic chemistry in the United Kingdom. Now, as I was getting towards the end of that PhD, I realized I didn't really have that much of an interest in you know, industrial chemistry or in academia, working as a, in a university environment. But I was really interested in sustainability and health and food, particularly vegan food. So I wanted to use my chemistry knowledge and experience in that field. And I was very fortunate. I got a position as an in-house product developer for a food company. And my job was actually to create new oat milk products. So it was all about uh, getting a, a new oat milk right from the, the recipe stage right at the beginning and scaling it up to launching into supermarkets and into cafes and coffee shops and that sort of thing. So what did a food scientist like me, what did I do day to day? Well, part of it was sort of market research and understanding what consumers want in terms of taste and what the, the attributes of the product they care about are so that you can make a product that they want to buy. So for instance, we would do uh, surveys or focus groups with some you know, consumers of the right demographic to see what they were interested in, whether they liked a certain packaging format, whether they liked a certain taste profile, how much they cared about different things, how much price was a factor, how much people, more would people pay for an organic product, for instance? What were people's attitudes to different ingredients or additives being added? And this I was then able to use to inform how I created the product and optimized a recipe. And so then that brings us on to the actual recipe. And I spent a lot of time sort of at, at, at bench top scale, almost on, a, on a, a lab workbench. It was somewhere between a laboratory and a kitchen because uh, it, was, it was food, obviously. So I spent a lot of time making very slightly different variations on recipes, constantly tweaking to try and get it better and better and better. Uh, so taste would be a big thing, but also how well, the, how well it foamed. People like a really nice foamy oat milk in coffees and that sort of thing. And also preventing it from sort of splitting or curdling. If, if you ever tried a plant milk, particularly in a tea or a coffee, you might often see it kind of almost looks like it's curdled. And this is something that happens because in that environment of the coffee is very acidic. Uh, and that can be one of the reasons why you get this kind of effect where the, the oat proteins change in that acidic environment. It can also have things to do with uh, the quality of the water that, that you use, that kind of thing. So I was working on recipes constantly to try and make the best uh, product that I could. I would then go away and sort of iterate on that. So I'd, I'd have the, the latest iteration of the recipe, go back and test that, taste test it, see what people thought, and then keep improving it over time. And also, as we got towards the end of that process, it was really about scaling up. So we had a recipe that we were happy with, we liked, and then we had to get it from you know a, a, a liter or so, a, a, a kind of a kitchen scale, up to tens of thousands of liters. So it would really become a... a much bigger things and there's quite a lot of challenges in moving from a very small scale to a massive scale. So that was also a big, big focus for me in that role. So, so that was my experience creating new food products. But then it's worth asking the question in general, how do food companies go about developing new products to launch into supermarkets and cafes and restaurants and all that kind of thing? Well, often it will start with an idea. So Maybe there'll be some idea of a new product, maybe something that someone else is doing already in the market, and they think, well, we could do something like that. Now, here's the snag. It takes a lot of time, and often money, and energy and thought 
to create a new food product. And it's risky because what if you go through all of that process, it can take months or years sometimes, lots of money, lots of time, and then no one buys it. And you've just wasted all of that time and you get nothing back for it. What do you do? Well, like a lot of industries, you tend to test as you go. You make small kind of prototypes or versions. You test it, test one formulation, see what people think, what people like, what they don't like, and then you go back and make some changes. So you've tested it many, many times throughout that process to eventually, hopefully, come out with something that people really enjoy eating or drinking. And so what do consumers care about most when it comes to food? Sometimes there's more than one answer to this, but very often the, the highest priority for consumers is taste. People rarely buy things that they don't like the taste of. And so it's, it's way too risky for a food company to release a new food product that people don't enjoy the taste of. Even if it's very healthy or very sustainable or it's really functional, it has some excellent attributes, it's in 100% recycled packaging or it's organic or it's got these particular vitamins in, whatever. Those are all great and people do, in, do like those and that might encourage someone to buy it or to try it. But if it doesn't taste good, you're going to run into problems. The product won't sell and you'll lose money, which obviously a company will not want to happen. Now, the company that I work for making my, my oat milk, it was a very small company. And we really did care about creating a product that, that did taste really good, but was also an ethical product. It was sustainable and that we were really proud of, that was good for you as well. And I, and I say that with complete sincerity. It's, it's totally true. And I think a lot of uh, smaller companies tend to be more like that. They're often driven by values or principles as well as by profits. It's not always the case, but very often I think for smaller companies that, that does tend to be more common. Additionally, that their practices and their sort of standard operating procedures aren't as standard. They're not as standardized because they're new and fresh and a little bit plucky, right? So there's more leeway for individual personalities to shape the products that they're going to put out. But even so, at the heart of it, the critical thing has got to be taste because people just won't buy it if it doesn't taste good and you're going to lose money. So you have to make a product that people want to buy, which means it has to taste good. So how does a food company go about making a product that tastes fantastic? You essentially do what's known in other industries as A-B testing. You create two very similar but slightly different formulations of your kind of prototype product. So for instance, with an oat milk, maybe I would create one version that's sort of the, the standard version that I'm working on so far, A, and then I go for another version B, which is the same except for maybe it's got a little bit more salt, a touch more salt. And then I would get uh, people to taste it and see which one they prefer. Do people like A more or do they like B more? If actually people liked B more, they preferred the taste of that slightly higher salt level, well, that would be the new uh, standard kind of baseline. And from there, I would test that B recipe against a C recipe with maybe a little bit less sugar. Maybe try a little bit less sugar and see which one people prefer. Maybe in this case, ah, people actually still preferred the slightly higher level of sugar. So you end up saying, okay, well, let's stick with B. And this process goes on and on and on. You test things many times until eventually you hone down on the optimal levels of all of these different taste kind of uh, uh, levers that you can, you can pull. And so you end up with the tastiest formulation that you, can, that you can easily get. And in the industry, this is called finding the bliss point. And it's so named because the taste of the food or the drink at that time gives people bliss. It's so delicious that people just absolutely love the taste of it. And this is what I did with hundreds of different oat milk recipes. And it wasn't just taste. I also uh, it kind of A-B tested for things like how well it foams, but taste was, was probably the, the key thing that I was working on. Okay, so this all sounds fine. What's the problem here? Well, the problem is that by and large, 
this process creates unhealthy foods. There's really a dark side here. And three ingredients in particular have a lot of power in making foods that people absolutely love the taste of. Fat, sugar, and salt. If you get the balance of these three right, sometimes it's, it's only one or two of them, but often it will be all three. That is your key to making delicious food products that people find irresistibly tasty. Just think about many of the tastiest foods that you might enjoy eating, and they will often have one, two, or all three of these. You know, chocolate has plenty of sugar, salt, and fat. So does a, a, a cheeseburger or a hamburger. So does cakes and biscuits. French fries don't have much sugar, but they have lots of salt and fat. Sweet candies are pretty much just sugar. There's just lots of sugar in there and sometimes, sometimes a little bit of fat as well. Pizza would be a great example. That has plenty, a lot of salt and fat and sometimes some sugar thrown in as well. In, for example, the tomato sauce. Processed meats like sausages and bacon and even processed vegan meats will tend to have a lot of salt and fat in them. And even things like bread. Most store-bought bread will have lots of salt and sometimes sugar as well added. So it just goes on and on like this. Most of the foods that people buy that haven't just come kind of as they are from nature, like a, an apple, will tend to have at least one or two, probably all three of these added to some extent. So as a general rule, if you think of an irresistibly tasty food, something that's, that's just tastes so good you can't stop eating it, it almost definitely will have been through this testing process and that bliss point of taste will have been found. That's going to appeal to the broadest range of people and get them to keep eating and buying more of it because that's the most profitable food then, isn't it? And that's what companies want. If you keep, you can't stop eating something, you'll keep buying more of it. And that's what a company wants you to do. Now, it's not just fat, sugar, and salt that, that are added to foods to make them uh, preferable to consumers. There's a whole host of other additives that people might put in. We're thinking of things like colors, preservatives, emulsifiers, thickeners, gelling agents. All these kind of things make the product more acceptable to consumers, whether that's uh, in terms of the visual appearance or the taste or the mouthfeel can be quite a big thing as well, how, how it actually feels in your mouth. But these additives will be used liberally alongside fat, sugar, and salt. And so this is where we get into the problem because adding fat, sugar, salt, and a load of food additives makes the food really quite unhealthy. It makes them delicious, but over a lifetime of eating these foods that are, that are very rich in fat, sugar, salt, and, and additives, we know we've got the, the scientific data to show that there's a much higher risk of life-threatening conditions, things like heart disease, and high blood pressure, and diabetes, and, and, and obesity, and maybe even some forms of cancers as well. And so we end up in this really vicious circle. Food companies want to make products that people like and people want to buy. And they will do that by developing the products and putting in different ingredients that make the food tastier, but also less healthy. And they do this because in the testing and the studies they do with consumers, that's what we like the taste most of. So then we love the taste, obviously, so we buy lots of them. And then the company says, fantastic, we're getting great sales results here. Let's keep making more like this and let's put a big marketing and advertising budget to make sure everyone knows about this new food product that we're going to, uh, that, that we're selling. Meanwhile, we eat them and over the years and decades, our health gets worse and worse and we feel terrible. But tasty food is always a, a relief, right? So then we go back and eat some more of this kind of ultra processed food. So we keep buying more and now we're back to the start and the cycle keeps going round. Now, in my personal case, creating the oat milk products I, I did, I can honestly hand, hold my hand on my heart and I can say that 
the products, whilst there is some level of, of salt, sugar and fat in them, they, I believe they are healthy products and they can be drunk you know, regularly as part of a healthy diet. I still drink them regularly. Whilst they were processed to some extent, of course they, they can have to be, they were still, I think, really good, really healthy, good quality products. And again, processed foods, some of them are not, and really not that bad. Some are, some aren't. And particularly, again, if they come from quite a small company, I think the chances are higher that they will place a greater value on keeping the product as, as kind of healthy and, and natural and unmessed with as they can. But unfortunately, since the food industry is dominated by really massive companies, there's going to be the exception far more than the rule. So what is the solution here? I don't know for sure. Maybe one day legislation will change and laws will come in to say that to prevent companies from adding certain amounts of, of fat, sugar and salt. And it is sort of going that way, certainly in, in the UK where, where I live, there are laws coming in that prohibit the advertising of, of certain less healthy products. But it's very slow and I really wouldn't bet on it making that much of a difference, particularly because we love the taste of it right? So, so we want to buy these, these uh, foods that, that are going to be deleterious for our long-term health. I think the only real solution is to eat a lot more unprocessed or minimally processed foods that have natural levels of salt, sugar, and fat in them. They don't have additives put in and they are packed with beneficial nutrients sort of as, as nature intended. I'm thinking of things like, like fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and whole grains and, and beans and lentils and chickpeas. But now here is the snag. Will these foods taste worse? The honest answer is quite possibly. Quite possibly they will. If they haven't been through this, this process of a team of, of food scientists trying to make them as tasty as possible, how could a carrot or an apple, <laughs> or you know, a bowl of rice, stand up to candies and cakes and, and chocolates and french fries. It's not possible. However, I think we do have one tool in our arsenal that can change the game, and that is cooking. Cooking allows us to, to have the edge and to inject flavor and texture into sort of unprocessed foods and make them tasty enough and, and kind of sensorially interesting enough in our mouths so that they can stand toe to toe against pizza and burgers and candy and hold their own and still be something that we really, really enjoy eating. Now, if learning more about cooking healthy vegan foods is something that you are interested in, full disclosure, I do offer uh, a vegan cooking course. It's called the Plant Your Health Cooking Boot Camp. And I really do think that would that will help anyone who is kind of a, a novice cook or new to plant-based cooking and really wanting to create tasty foods in a convenient way. That will help you get there. But honestly, as much as I think that really actually would help you improve your cooking skills, you don't need it. Just get in your kitchen, follow some cookbooks, some recipes. There's an endless amount for free online and you will start to make delicious foods that you can enjoy eating enough so that you're not tempted too much by these more processed foods. And over time your skills will improve and you'll be able to make outstanding meals. Now if you would like to learn a little bit more about the Plant Your Health Cooking Boot Camp and see how it can work for you, you can feel free to check that out. There's a link down in the description below and that'll take you to where you can find out a little bit more about it and see if it would help you on your journey. And there is a 30 day, no questions asked, money back guarantee on that course. So if at any point in the first 30 days you feel it's not right for you, let me know and I will give you back every single penny, no questions. I've been Dr. Ryan Williams, your host and the founder of Growing Pure, where I help you achieve health and vitality through delicious vegan food. Now, if you've enjoyed this video and you've gotten value from it, then you might also like to learn about my, my journey to discovering the health benefits of a plant-based diet and how you could do the same. 
And I talk about this in my review of the book, How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. It was a, it's a really game-changing book and I think it's worth everyone reading. But if you'd like to find out a little bit more, you can watch my video review of it by clicking right here. Friend, I wanna thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next video.